if the owner of the property are sold, that it will sell with tenants' rights. We've talked about that. Unless there is a specific clause in the lease that says something to the effect of, if I sell the property, this lease will terminate, which I don't see a lot in a in friends of mine that have residential leases. So tenants need to be told of this. If you're an investor and you own a rental and you're thinking about selling it, you better have a conversation because they are probably uneducated in the actual laws of their state. And you would go to them and say, hey, look, I'm going to sell the property, but don't worry. Your lease will stay in place under our state law that says tenants' rights. Most every state I know of has that. Florida has it. Virginia has it. Indiana has it. So the tenant's lease will stay in place. If it's an at will, and we talked about the death of either party would terminate that. And then this is what I was talking about. Unless that lease has a specific clause in it that says, hey, if I sell the property, your lease will terminate. Now, the leases could also terminate due to an operation of law, like one party or the other may file bankruptcy. Those leases could end. During the process of that lease, there could be a breach a breach of the lease is where one party or the other fails to uphold their requirement. And because of that, they could be subject to some court action. All right. They could be some court action. If the tenant breaches the lease, the landlord can sue for damages. And damages is a collective term, which could be physical damages or unpaid rent. That is a damage. Okay. So the landlord could sue the tenant for that. If the landlord sues the tenant, you will hear this term called actual eviction. This is the eviction clause. Most states require that the landlord give notice to the tenant and a lot of times they will also give them what's called the opportunity to cure the problem. So in other words, they're late, they haven't paid. So the landlord gives notice to the tenant and says, if you don't bring the back rent due by the 10th, I am going to evict you through a suit for possession. And I am going to ask for all of those interests that you have to be reverted back to me. That is an actual eviction. And that will have some number of days to cure the problem. That's the word they use. So the tenant goes, oh, dude, I'm sorry. I was on vacation. I forgot to write you the check. But here's all of the back rent. And we're now back happy with each other. If the tenant fails to leave peacefully, then the landlord must get the court's approval. Every state that I know of uses this. They cannot forcibly go in and like turn the electric off. You can't take the front door off the, the house. The tenant has to go through a court process. The tenant can have the court removed forcibly. They can get a court order for the uh, constable to go down and he will start moving stuff out, but you cannot do that. There is a second version of this. This is where the tenant sues the landlord because the landlord has breached their uh, contract. This is called constructive eviction. So think of this like the tenant has evicted themselves because the landlord has not maintained the property in a habitable condition. And that is almost always the main requirement. The property can't be lived in. 
they consciously have neglected to put the roof back on after the tornado. The land tenant's going to go, dude, I can't live in a property that has no roof. I am moving out because it is uninhabitable. I had a young lady try and claim this during my eviction process. And she said, Your Honor, I'm trying to claim a constructive eviction. And the landlord said, okay, one question. Are you living in the property? And she said, and I quote, yes, I am, but we are trying. And the judge st said, stop. If you are living in the property, then it's definitely not uninhabitable. I am denying your request for constructive eviction. It must be uninhabitable due to some neglect of the landlord. Now, this is a very fine line. There are people that go, well, the air conditioner was out for two days and I can't stay in that house, so I'm claiming constructive eviction. No, that is not deemed uninhabitable. And the second part of that statement, if you caught it, is two days. There has to be reasonable time frame. You can't say, well, the roof blew off 10 minutes ago and you haven't fixed it, I'm moving out. There has to be a reasonable time frame to give that landlord to fix it. It may be tomorrow or the next day before we can get a roof tarp on it because it's still storming out or I just found out about it or you live on the north side and I'm way down here. It, uh, it takes time. Most states use this thing called the Uniform Landlord Residential Landlord Tenant Act. And we have talked about this. This law describes what both parties should do. There is a description and provides for certain obligations that the landlords are required to do, like keep the property habitable. There are requirements that the tenant's supposed to do, like pay rent agreed upon in the lease. So there are specific requirements for both parties. There also are specific remedies for each party, meaning if you fail to do this, you could be subject to a suit for possession or actual eviction. Or it could say if the tenant and landlord fails to do this, he could be subject to constructive eviction. So this Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act spells out all kinds of different things. Another thing it spells out is that access to the property that we talked about, where it says, okay, the landlord must give 24 hours notice or four hours notice. Actually, I think it says must give reasonable notice unless there is a emergency situation and they define that to be things like cries for help, fire, uh, flea, the sound of free flowing water. So this law, which has been in, adopted by most, if not all states, actually spells out how the landlord and tenant shall interact with each other. Because this is still dealing with real estate, we have talked about fair housing. It is not just for the sale or the conveyance of property. It is also inside of the landlord and the uh, tenant requirements. You cannot use any of those seven protected classes as a reason to deny leasing a property to somebody because of the fair housing laws. There was in that 1988 change, remember the amendment to the Fair Housing Act of 1988? That is what brought in the, the protection for families and disability. You cannot rent to someone because they have given or they have too many kids. Now, I have told you back in a previous chapter that there are exceptions to every one of the protected classes except race. There's never an exception for race. The fam family status. Let's say you have a two bedroom house and a young lady comes in and says, well, I wanna rent your two bedroom house. It's me and my five children. You could say, sorry, you have too many kids. And that person goes, well, wait, that's discrimination based on family. No, there is a health and safety code, 
which supersedes these laws because it's not safe. And that law says that you cannot put more than two people per bedroom in a rental. You have too many people to live safely in that property. That would be an example of an exception for the protection against families with children. So like you cannot segregate individuals. Hey, all the Martians live over on this side and all the Earthlings live over on this side. You can't do that. You also have to allow any of your rentals to be altered by the person that has disability. Remember, we talked about that exception. I could literally say to somebody, I can't rent you my house because I cannot afford to put grab bars in the bathroom. I cannot afford to build a ramp. But if that tenant says, I will pay for those myself, then that exemption goes out the door. You also, and we've mentioned this several times, you cannot charge different security deposit rates based upon a person's need. Uh, well, that person's, you know, has a disability. I'm going to charge them more security. You cannot do that. But the verbiage game that we play is you can charge an extra one. There may be a second deposit that is allowable. All right, so that's the chapter that deals with the leasehold estate. And once again, I don't want to beat the dead horse, but understand there's the freehold estate and the leasehold estate. Freehold is forever, which is an undefined period of time. And a leasehold is a limited, which is a defined period of time. And that period of time is based upon those four that we talked about, period to period, at will, and a state for years, and a state at sufferance, all of that. So I would suggest that you go through and do some of the homework. Um, there's a couple math problems that deal with the leases and per specifically that percentage. So watch out for the word or versus the word and. Is it a base or a percentage, whichever is the higher, or is it a base plus a percentage, all right? Once again, if you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com and we can talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, you know, we could talk about other real estate or we could talk about this chapter too. So thank you and I'll see you in the next chapter. Have a good day.